Before half term in geography, we started to find out about the Maasai tribe from Kenya. And also we noticed that Maasai spelt lots of different ways. I've seen it spelt this way on the BBC website. I've also seen it spelt this way with a double A there. And there is a picture of some people from the Maasai tribe. Now they're from the country of Kenya and they live in a place called the Maasai Mara, which is those amazing grasslands where you see all the famous African animals. So they live alongside the giraffes, the lions and the elephants. And this shows some of the decoration, some of the jewellery that they wear. So both men and women wear these necklaces and headdresses, especially for celebrations. And if you've ever seen one of the necklaces close up, they're actually made of thousands of very tiny little beads that are threaded on. And they add more and more rings to these necklaces as they get older. So the more important you are, the bigger your necklace. And the beads, the colours have different meanings. So the red is for warriors and for blood. White is for peace. Blue is for water. And green is for the grass and the land. They wear bright clothes and they're often red. And they also wear something called tartan. Now you might recognise tartan. That's this cloth here from Scotland or from Ireland in our country. But it's also quite famous amongst the Maasai tribe to wear those same sort of tartan patterns and this is what we found out before, that they're herders and they herd cows and goats. And they use the cows for absolutely everything. So they drink the cow's milk and the blood as a sacred drink. They use the cow's dung to cover and seal their homes. They don't often kill the cattle for eating them, unlike we do. But when a cow is killed for like a special celebration, then the horns are used for containers. The hides of the skin is used to make shoes and clothes and ropes and bed coverings. And the hooves and the bones are made into ornaments. So the more cows a man owns, the richer he's thought to be. So for many thousands of years, there was no money at all in their society. The money was really the cows. It was how many cows you had. And we found out how they move their homes from time to time. So their homes aren't built to last for a long, long time. They're built to last for a year or two. And then they move somewhere else because their cows have eaten all the grass in that little area. So they move along to help the grass recover to another part of the Maasai Mara. And the women build new homes for the village. The Maasai men have different jobs from the Maasai women. They're in charge in the tribe and when boys are 14 years old, they are ready to become warriors. The men go out onto the Maasai Mara to hunt animals to feed their families. When they were 14 years old, boys used to go out alone to hunt lions, which was to sort of prove how brave they are. And nowadays, actually, the Maasai people help protect the lions and they're sort of working with the government to help save many of the African animals that are being hunted by poachers. The women take care of the children and they build the huts and take care of the home. They prepare the meals and the food and they make the clothing. They also make the necklaces, dresses and headdresses out of tiny beads. Now another thing that the Maasai are famous for is a jumping dance that the men do. They jump as high as they can for as long as they can. And the man that can jump the highest is seen to be the strongest and the best warrior. So he's sometimes become an elder or a chief. And when we do this in class, we actually have a bit of a competition to see who can jump the highest. And when you look at the photographs, you can see they are jumping very high. The women also sing and dance different songs and dances. They sing for their babies, their husbands and to celebrate. They always sing and dance amongst themselves and separately from the men. And there's another picture of the jumping dance. Now, I want you to think about what it would be like if you were in the Maasai tribe. So children in the tribes have lives very different from you, but they're the same in lots of ways too. Their parents care for them and do all they can to keep them safe, and they like to play together and love to be outside. Now, I overheard some of the children in school when they were talking about the video before about the Maasai, and they're like, oh, look at that. Oh, I wouldn't want to live. Oh, look, they live in a mud hut. But think about it a bit more carefully. For lots of years, the government in Kenya has been trying to get the Maasai people to move into the cities, to move out of their villages, and they haven't wanted to. So they've wanted to have, you know, they want medicines and they want schools, but they don't want to give up their way of life. They're very proud of their traditions and the way they live and the freedom they have. They don't really want to live in tiny little flats in cities. 
They want to stay and keep up their traditions, but they also understand the importance of having good health care and having schools for the children. So unlike you, Maasai children work. Mostly they herd the goats and the cattle, and when they're not herding, they help their mothers carry water and care for the homes. Some children don't go to school because there isn't a school close enough for them to reach. They don't have cars or bikes to help them get there, and the roads in the Maasai Mara are hard to travel on. But the government, the Kenyan government, has put lots of money in to build schools. So more and more skills of schools are being built for the Maasai children. And now actually lots of them do go to school. I think now, because this is a bit out of date, this PowerPoint, the Kenyan government say there is a school for every child in Kenya. Now, if you look at their schools, they are very different to our school, but they're actually learning similar things. They also learn English as well. Now, what I want you to think about is how life would be different if you were a member of the Maasai tribe and things that would be good, the good things. Because sometimes we look at something that's different, we think, oh, I don't like that, that's different, I wouldn't like that. And maybe think about if someone from the Maasai tribe came to your life and lived in your house and came to ask, well, what would they think of it? What would they miss? What would they wish they could go back to? Now, there's a story I'm going to read you about a little girl who imagines She's in the Maasai tribe and I'm going to include some pictures at the end as well of children from the tribes. This story is called Maasai and I by Virginia Kroll with illustrations by Nancy Carpenter. And it's about a little girl, I think it's maybe American or Canadian, imagining what it would be like if she were Maasai. And the title page contrasts the traffic of the city where she lives with the elephants roaming freely in Kenya. That day at school, we learned about East Africa and a tall, proud people called the Maasai. I feel the tingle of kinship flowing through my veins. I walk home to our block of flats. I've met Mrs Stroud across the passage and the Johnson family in number four, but that's all. If I were Maasai, I would have no neighbours who were strangers living in flats up and down the corridors. Our huts would sit in a circle around a large animal pen called a kraal, and everyone would know everyone else. We always have to wait for Daddy to get home so we can eat together. If I were Maasai, Daddy and Ray would be eating with the other men, and Mama and I with the other women. Ray fills the water jug at the kitchen sink. If I were Maasai, my brother would walk long distances to find a water hole and he would bring the water back in giant gourds. What's for pudding, I ask. Mama gives me money to buy a chocolate bar and Ray and I walk to the corner shop. If I were Maasai and I wanted something sweet, I'd wait for the honey guy to come. The little bird would chatter wildly above my head, begging me to follow. I'd lop along below and it would lead me to a beehive. I'd light a fire with sticks rubbed hard together and make a smoking torch to calm the bees. Then I would scoop the honeycomb and leave enough behind for my friend the bird. Before we leave, Mama says, come in when the street lights turn on. I look up at the sky and sigh. If I were Maasai, I would stay out till the bat's caves echoed with empty silence, until the low white moon glowed yellow and rose above, until whole flocks of flashing fireflies turned streets into lanterns. I would go inside then, only to sleep. I would not climb any stairs. If I were Maasai, I would lift a cowhide flap and I'd be home. If I were Maasai, I couldn't look out of my window and see what's going on in the street below. My hut would have no windows, only small holes to let out the smoke. We would not have any couches or chairs, lamps or tables either, only several stools. Next morning, Mama gets ready to go to work. If I were Maasai, she'd stay nearby, milking the cows and tanning animal hides. Make your beds before you go, Mama calls to Ray and me. I straighten my sheets and stretch my ruffled bedspread. If I were Maasai, I'd spread a cowhide on the bare earth at night and roll it back up in the morning. I wouldn't have my hamster Huey in his cage if I were Maasai. I would have cows through a whole, through a whole herd and I'd know everyone by name. I would not have to go to the zoo to see giraffes or ostriches or zebras either. I'd share the African air with them, the African soil and the African rain. 
I set out for school and run back for my new white trainers I'd almost forgot. I've got gym today. If I were Maasai, I'd run and leap in bare brown feet across lush pastures or pale parched earth. And only once in a great, great while, I'd wear sandals made of buffalo hide. That evening, my brother and I fight over who gets the bathroom first. We're going to grandma's party at a restaurant. It's her 70th birthday. I wash with scented soap and dry my skin with a thick towel. If I were Maasai preparing for a celebration, I'd rub my skin with cow's fat mixed with red clay so that my skin would shine. I'd want to smell nice if I were Maasai, just like I do now, so I'd crush sweet-smelling leaves to rub along my shiny skin. My cousin James come over and we pile into the car to drive to the party. If I were Maasai, walking three miles would be nothing for me. I'd glide across grasslands, open and free. And there's a picture of a Maasai celebration. Later, when her birthday dinner is over, Grandma stares at me. My, my, Linda, she says, how slender and graceful you are. Such a beautiful young girl. I kiss her with love and respect, just as I would if I were Maasai. If I were Maasai, my name might be Esha or Hawa or Nima or even Linde, almost like it is now. I come home and stare at my reflection in my bedroom mirror, smooth brown skin over high cheekbones and black eyes that slant up a little when I smile. I like what I see. I tingle again with that feeling about kinship. I would look just like this if I were Maasai. get your next pack there will be a sheet to do with this video but just for now I want you to see if you can think of some things you might enjoy if you were Maasai. So some of the things about their life, the positive things like the freedoms they have compared to some of the things that we have in our way of life. So that's something I just want you to think about. Maybe you could write a couple of sentences about some of the positive things about their way of life.